let's talk briefly about how archaeologists conduct their research. Archaeology is a science, and science is first and foremost a way of looking at the world and explaining why things are the way they are. In this sense, it's empirical, meaning it's concerned with observable, with the observable and measurable world. In order to be scientific, a question must be measurable. Science is systematic and replicable. This means that we're able to take careful notes and specify procedures so that others can repeat what, what, they, what you have done. Science is predictive and explanatory. This means that we perform experiments to generate theories that predict what will happen in a given scenario and explain why. We don't just come up with, with pet theories without having the backing of, of data. And finally, science is self-critical and self-correcting. So how do I know that I know something? How do I know that I'm wrong? We don't understand something by proving it's right, but by carefully showing how competing theories can't be right. So in other words, we, we go through a whole process and come down with the best possible explanation. The scientific method begins and ends with facts, and as newly discovered facts emerge, these suggest new hypotheses. So the scientific process usually starts when you've made an observation about some process or phenomenon that strikes your interest. So you conduct a literature review to find out what is already known about the topic. This helps you to define your problem. So you're probably asking some sort of why question, why is something the way it is? And that helps you to figure out what your problem actually is. Second step would be to establish one or more hypotheses. It's usually simplest if you test one of these at a time rather than this helps you to rule out multiple factors that might be contributing to different patterns so you know precisely what it is you're trying to target in a specific experiment. The third step is to determine the empirical implications, which means the ver those implications that would be verifiable by observations. And we draw these implications from the hypothesis itself. And so this typically takes the form of if-then statements. So if A is true, then we can conclude B, for example. The fourth step is to collect appropriate data through observation and or experimentation. Our fifth step then would be to test the hypothesis by comparing our data with the expected implications, so those if-then statements. Then the last step is to reject, revise, and or retest our hypotheses as necessary. So if we don't find any supporting evidence for that particular hypothesis, well then we start the whole process over again. Come up with a new hypothesis, work our way through that cyclical process yet again. Now when we implement the scientific process, there are two forms of reasoning or two types of reasoning that are usually involved. The first being inductive reasoning, and this means that we are working from specific facts or observations to general conclusions. In this type of reasoning, hypotheses account for the known facts in a particular case and helped us to predict unobservable phenomena. The other type of reasoning is what we call deductive, and this involves moving from a theory to predict specific observable or experimental results. Scientists don't test hypotheses, they test the logical material consequences of their hypotheses. And this is where those if-then statements come into effect. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the important implications of the scientific method is that it is, involves testability. This means that the implications of the hypothesis can be measured in some fashion with the same results obtained by different observers. So testability, replicability, you know, someone else running the same experiment should get similar results to what you saw or observed if what you observed is accurate. So, moving back to archaeology, um, as I mentioned in one of our earlier lectures, not everything you see in Indiana Jones is true, but this quote actually is. So, 70% of all archaeology is done in the library. We do research, research, research. We read all kinds of materials and information to help us, um, to help inform our research. The scientific method in archaeology is actually broken into different stages that parallel the broad steps of the scientific method. So the structure of archaeological theory, um, therefore, builds from the ground up. When I talk about theory in this case, 
This is, you know, an answer to the why question, an explanation for the observed or empirical phenomenon that we are exploring. Theories seek to explain the relationships between different variables, and there are three different levels of theory that are distinguished within archaeology, not necessarily by the complexity or difficulty of the theory, but by their place in the process of archaeological inquiry. So at the lowest level, low-level theory, we make observations. We take measurements, and we record attributes of objects that we recover from the material record. And this ensures that our data are comparable across projects. So different ceramic forms, for example, you know, if they're defined well enough, we can apply those same forms and definitions to multiple cases and multiple sites. This then moves us up a level to what's called middle-level theory. And at this point, we are specifying links between the data and the human behaviors we're trying to explain. This is when we tend to create those sort of if-then statements. So if I see this in my data, then I can conclude that this is the behavior that would have caused that patterning to, to form. And another way that we develop middle range theory is actually going out and trying to observe human or natural processes as they occur in real time. Um, so we go and conduct ethnographic research within a modern community. So maybe I would go study and work with a indigenous potter to learn about how they actually form their pottery and that would allow me to then learn the traces that might be left behind in different forming techniques and I could hopefully try to start recognizing those within the archaeological materials that I have. Okay, oops. This then brings us to high level theory, and this is where we really try and go after these big picture questions. We're really trying to learn things about human, the human condition at a grand scale, and this is the result of building up from the level of our observations, the middle range theory that we're able to develop, and then tying into these, these greater questions. So your textbook touches a bit on this, but as a model of archaeological inquiry, um, that is what's represented here within this figure. So the entire process that we are discussing, this takes place within a specific social, cultural, and political context, and that's what's represented by this larger pink box that you see here. Scientists aren't able to step outside of their own culture, so it's really important for us to recognize any of our biases that we might be bringing into the interpretations that we're trying to draw and to check those at the door. So let's pretend that we are interested in looking at the frequencies of different ceramic types within a site. Well, our paradigms, that's the way we conceptualize the world, our sort of worldview, the way we understand why and how things are the way they are, that's represented in the figure here by this dashed line that you can see. And it's dashed because there's an interplay that actually occurs between the social, cultural, and political context within which our research is being conducted and our paradigm itself, or the theoretical framework, I guess, would be another way to talk about paradigm. So based on our paradigm and what we already know about a particular case study, we formulate a set of hypotheses for example, um, let's say there was a breakdown in social cohesion at a site and that that contributed to the site's abandonment. That would be a particular hypothesis, perhaps drawn from my own dissertation research. Um, okay, so going to our pottery example, you know, perhaps our if-then statements might be something like people selected pottery types based on what they liked stylistically or households always used and produced this, this one predominant type that we see in the assemblage that we're analyzing. So as we move through our middle level theory, we develop a set of if-then statements that are expected outcomes of the question we're trying to address. So going back to the pottery again, the frequencies of different types changed over time. If the frequencies of different types changed over time, that is people's tastes would have changed over time. We can see that. Or another if-then statement is that the relative frequencies of pottery types did not change over time at the site. That is, one type always predominated the assemblages. We conduct our data collection. So we go out, we excavate a sample from the site in question, classify the pottery into types, 
count the number of each type, compare the observed data to our expectations to see which hypothesis is supported or refuted. And at this stage, it's important to remember that we're only capturing a snapshot in time from a specific area within the site. So our data are not providing us with the full picture of the real past. So we have to make careful propositions about what we're able to learn from our data and the interpretations that we draw. Most importantly, we need to share our findings with the public through formal presentations at conferences and in public outreach forums. This provides feedback from other experts in the field, which allows us to then reevaluate our hypotheses. So that's that reject, revise, or retest stage of the scientific method. We can make any necessary changes to our hypotheses or decide to test a new hypothesis and begin this whole process over again. <clears throat> a few more words briefly on paradigms in archaeology. There have been changes in the predominant way we understand how the world works and how that applies to archaeological research over time. And I don't really want you to concern yourself too much with understanding the, you know, the specific details of each of these different paradigms, but just be aware that our conceptualizations have changed over time within the field and very likely will still continue to. And this is the case in any kind of scientific discipline. Okay, so in your reading for this module, there is a section that talks about something called the mound builder myth. And I want you to read that section carefully, and I want you to try and identify for yourself the hypothesis, three if-then statements related to that hypothesis, two ways that data were collected and what the data actually were, and then evaluate that hypothesis that you were able to identify using the data, which, um, which of the if-then statements seems to be supported most by the evidence. So go ahead, pause this, this lecture now, go take a look at that, and come back when you're done. All right, well, I hope that you, um, you took my advice and went ahead and did that and are now back. Welcome back. So let's take a look at the mound builder myth. It's my hope that the hypothesis that you were able to identify is that American Indians are not the descendants of the mound builders. That was the thinking at that time. These if-then statements, therefore, the testable expectations we have, would be first that if American Indians do not know anything about mound building, then there should be no explorer accounts of American Indians building mounds. Our second if-then statement is that if metal artifacts found in the mounds signified a superior mound builder culture, then American Indians should lack the manufacturing technology because if they're not the ones who made the mounds, they shouldn't be um, able to access metal artifacts. <clears throat> so the researchers went out, conducted their data collection from 2,000 sites in 21 different states, which they summarized in, you know, just a short little 700 page report. What they found were that reports by Spanish and French explorers described mound construction and use by American Indians. So already we're seeing one piece of information that reflects back on our testable hypotheses, or sorry, testable expectations. Another form of data that they found was that native copper in the Great Lakes region didn't actually require technology um, for smelting in order to be shaped into stone hammers. So this means that uh, American Indians did, in fact, have uh, metallurgy technology that didn't involve smelting. So, how does this information then reflect back on our evaluation of our hypothesis? Well, the evidence suggests that, in fact, American Indians could and likely did construct the mounds that fascinated early American archaeologists. So, we have refuted our hypothesis in this case and concluded that American Indians are actually the descendants, likely to be the descendants of the mound builder culture. Okay, the one last bit for this module then is your first summary slash discussion of the semester. We're going to have 10 of these throughout the semester. Um, sometimes I will be asking you to summarize and discuss what was being said by the author in a discussion board, um, and a few other times it'll just be a um, a matter of you summarizing the argument being made and just submitting that without discussing it. So for the first discussion summary, 
You're going to read and assess the argument that's being made in the what does it mean to me box in chapter two. And I want you to, to think about it. Do you agree with what the author is saying? Why or why not? You are responsible then for posting an original response um, in the form of a short summary of the argument that was being made and explaining your opinion on the issue. Be sure to take a side. Um, think critically about it, incorporate any information or data from the course materials that support your position. <clears throat> Paraphrasing is allowed, but um, you should be using proper citations. Keep that in mind. After posting your original response, I want you to then read through the post with your classmates and respond to at least one other post to receive full credit for participating in the discussion. Have fun!